<sighs> Have some, my dear. I don't feel like it. A little vodka, maybe. No, I don't drink vodka every day, and it's stuffy today. Nanny, how long have we known each other? How long? Goodness, let me think. You first came here to these parts, when was it? Vera Petrovna, Sonia's mother, was still alive then. In her day, you came to see us two winters. Uh, well, then it's been 11 years, and maybe, maybe even more. Have I changed much since then? Oh, very much. You were young and handsome then, and you've grown old now. Your looks aren't what they used to be. And you drink vodka now, too. Well, in ten years, I've become a different person. And why is that? I, uh, I'm overworked, Nanny. On my feet from morning till night, never resting. At night, I lie in bed afraid that they might drag me out to see a patient. The entire time we've known each other, I haven't had a single day off. How could I not grow old? But then life itself is boring, stupid, and filthy. This life, it sucks you in. You're surrounded by oddballs, nothing but oddballs. And after living with them two or three years, you too, unbeknownst to yourself, little by little, become an oddball yourself. It's your inescapable lot in life. Looking at, look at this little mustache. <laughs> A stupid mustache. I've become an oddball, nanny. Maybe I haven't grown stupid yet, thank God. Still have my wits about me, but the feelings have somehow grown blunt. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. I don't love anybody. Well, with the exception of you, of course. When I was little, I had a nanny like you. You want some something to eat, maybe? No. The third week of Lent, I went to... Malitsko, uh, where the epidemic was. Spotted fever in the huts, peasants are side by side, all in a row, the filth, the stench, the smoke. The calves are on the floor next to the sick, and the pigs are there too. I plugged away all day without sitting down once, not a drop past my lips, and when I got home, they won't let me rest either. They brought a switchman from the railroad. I put him on the table to operate, and he ups and dies under the chloroform. And when I need it least, pangs of conscience act up as if I had intentionally killed him. I sat down, closed my eyes like this, and I'm thinking, those who live a hundred or two hundred years after us, and for whom we're now paving the way, will they remember us kindly? No. Nanny, no, they won't. People won't, but God will. Thank you for that. Well said. Well. Well? Did you sleep well? Yes, very. Oh, ever since the professor and his spouse came here, our life has jumped the track. I sleep at the wrong time, eat spicy food at breakfast and lunch, drink wine. That's not good. Before we didn't have a moment to spare, Sonia and I worked. My respects, but now Sonia works and all I do is sleep, eat, and drink. That's not good. Some customs. The professor gets up at noon, and the samovar's been boiling all morning, just waiting for him. <laughs> Before they got here, we used to sit down to eat at noon like everybody, but now it's after six at night. The professor reads and writes, and then around one in the morning, out of the blue, there goes the bell. Heavens, what is it? Tea. Wake everyone up for him. Start the samovar. Some customs. How long are they going to stay there? A hundred years. <laughs> The professor has decided to settle down here. Same as now, the samovar's been on the table for two hours and they go for a walk. Here they come, don't you worry. Fine, fine, wonderful views. Yes, remarkable, your excellency. Tomorrow we'll go to the for forest preserve, Papa. Would you like to? Ladies and gentlemen, tea is served. My dear friend, send the tea to my study, would you? I still have to finish a few things today. You'll definitely like it in the forest preserve. It's hot and stuffy. But our famous scholar is wearing a coat, a galoshes, gloves, and carrying an umbrella. That means he's taking care of himself. How beautiful she is, so beautiful. Never in my life have I seen a more beautiful woman. You know, Marina Timofevna, riding through the fields, walking in the shade of the garden, or looking at this table here, I feel this inexpressible bliss. The weather is charming. The birds are singing. We are allowed to live in peace and army. What, what more do we need? Much too much obliged. Her eyes. A marvelous woman. Come tell us something, even Petrovich. What can I tell you? Is there, is there anything new? 
There's nothing new. Same old. I'm as sa I'm same as always. Probably even worse because I've become lazy. I don't do anything. Grumble like an old fart. The old chatterbox, Mama, is still blathering about the emancipation of women. One eye looks into the grave while the other still searches her learned books for the dawn of a new life. And the professor? <laughs> the professor still sits in his study. From morning till night, writing, with straining brain and furrowed brow, we write heroic odes, nights and days, but neither we nor they receive the praise. Ugh, I feel pity for the paper he's writing on. He should do his autobiography instead. Now, now that's an extraordinary story. Just think, a retired professor, this learned old fossil, this, this cold fish, gout, rheumatism, migraine, his liver swollen from jealousy and envy, this fossil's living on his first wife's estate, living here against his will because he can't afford to live in the city. He's always complaining about his misfortunes, although, in fact, he's unbelievably unfortunate. Just think how lucky he is. A son of a simple deacon, a seminarian, attains academic degrees, lands a professor's chair, and becomes his excellency, a son-in-law of a senator, etc., etc. Never mind that, but take this. The man's been writing about an art for 25 years, and he doesn't understand a thing about it. For 25 years, he's been chewing other people's thoughts on realism, naturalism, and other such nonsense. For 25 years, he's, he's been reading and writing things that any intelligent person has known for ages, and the stupid ones couldn't care less about it. it. It means that for 25 years, he's been pouring water through a sieve. Yet what conceit, what pretensions. He's retired, and not a single living person knows of him. He's utterly unknown. It means that for 25 years, he's occupied someone else's place. But look at him strutting there like a demigod. Well, it seems like you're, it seems you're jealous. Yes, I'm jealous. His success with women, not even Don Juan ever had this kind of success. His first wife, my sister, a beautiful and gentle creature, pure as this blue sky, honorable, generous soul who had more suitors than he had ever had students. She loved him as the only purest of angels can love others as pure and fine as themselves. My mother, his mother-in-law, still adores him and he still inspires sacred awe in her. His second wife, a beauty, very intelligent. You just saw her. She married him when he was very old. She gave him her youth, beauty, freedom, her radiance. For what? Why? Is she faithful to the professor? Unfortunately, she is. Why unfortunately? Because her faithfulness is a fraud through and through. It's all rhetoric and no logic. Cheating on an elderly husband whom you can't stand, that's immoral. Trying, on the other hand, to repress in yourself your poor youth and natural feelings, that's not immoral. Vanya, I don't like it when you say things like that. No, please. Those who cheat on their wives or husbands are by definition disloyal. They could betray a country as well. Waffles, turn off the tap. Allow me, Vanya. My wife ran away with her beloved the day after our wedding due to my uncomely appearance. After that, I was... I always fulfilled my duty. I love her to this day. I'm still faithful to her. I help her as much as I can. I gave her all I had in order to raise the children that she had by her beloved. I gave up happiness, but I kept my pride. And she, her youth is gone, her beauty, in keeping with the laws of nature, has faded, and her beloved passed away. What is, what is she left with now? Nanny, the peasants are here. Go talk to them. I'll do to myself. I came here to see your husband. You wrote to me that he was very ill, rheumatism and something else, but it turns out he's in tip-top shape. He was under the weather yesterday evening, complained of leg pains, but today he seems all right. And I raised 20 years here at breakneck speed. Oh, uh, well, it's not the first time, but I'm staying till tomorrow, and I'll eat, I'll at least sleep a qu quantum satis. Fine, then. It's not often that you spend the night here. You probably haven't eaten. No, ma'am, I haven't. Then you'll eat with us, too. We eat around six now. The tea's cold. Yes, the temperature has dropped significantly in the samovar. It doesn't matter. Ivan Ivanich will drink it cold. I'm sorry, ma'am. Not Ivan Ivanich, but Ilya Illich. Ma'am. Ilya Illich, Telogen. Or, as some call me on account of my pockmarked face, Waffles. 
long time ago I baptized Sonia, and His Excellency, your spouse, knows me very well. I'm now staying with you at the same estate, ma'am. As you may have noticed, I dine with you every day. Ilya Ilyich is our helper and our right hand. Dear Godfather, let me pour some you some more tea. Ah, what's the matter, Grandmother? I forgot to tell Alexander that I'm losing my mind, that I've received a letter from Karkov, from Pavel Alexevich. He sent me his new pamphlet. Is it new? Is it interesting? Yes, interesting, but a little strange. He's refuting the very thing he defended seven years ago. It's awful. There's nothing awful about it, Mama. Drink your tea. But I want to talk. For fifty years we've been talking and talking and reading pamphlets. It's time to be done with it. For some reason you don't like listening when I'm speaking. Pardon me, Jean, but in the last year you've changed so much that I don't recognize you at all. You used to be a man of convictions, an enlightened individual. Oh, yes, I was an enlightened individual who shed light on no one. I was an enlightened individual. You could not have made a more spiteful joke. I'm 47 years old now. Until last year, I tried deliberately, just like you, to obscure my vision with all this pedantry of yours so as not to see real life, and I thought I was doing the right thing, but now, if you only knew, I lie awake at night, frustrated and angry that I've so stupidly wasted the chance to enjoy all those things that my old age denies me now. Uncle Vanya, that's boring. It's as if you're accusing your former convictions of something, but they aren't the ones to blame. You are. You are forgetting that convictions alone are nothing, a dead letter. You had to commit to the cause. The cause? Not everyone can be a writing perpetuum mobile, like, like your hair professor. What are you trying to say? Grandmother, Uncle Vanya, I entreat you. I'll be quiet, I'll be quiet, and I apologize. The weather is very good today. It's not hot. It's good weather to hang yourself. Chica, chica, chica. Nanny, what the, did the peasants want? It's the same old thing, same old thing. Still about the empty field. Chica, chica, chica. Who are you calling, then? The speckled hen took off her little ones. I worry the crows might snatch them. Is the doctor here? This way, Mikhail Alvovich. They've sent for you. From where? From the factory. Much obliged. Well, I have to go. Damn, what a shame. Yes, it's so unfortunate, really. After the factory, come eat with us. I'm afraid it'll be too late, too. Then, not likely. Not possible. Look here. Go get me, would you? A shot of vodka. Not likely. Not possible. There's a character in a play by Ostrovsky. A man with a long mustache and short wits. That's me. Goodbye, ladies and gentlemen. Should you decide to drop by my place with Sofia Alexandrovna here, I'll be most glad to see you. I have a puny little estate, less than 80 acres in all, but if you're interested... There's an excellent orchard and a forest nursery, the likes of which you couldn't find for a thousand miles around, right next to me. There's a national forest preserve. The forest there is old and always sick, so I essentially take care of everything. I've already been told about your love of forests. You can, of course, do a great deal of good, but doesn't it get in the way of your true calling? After all, you're a doctor. God only knows what our true calling is. Is it interesting? Yes, it's very interesting. Very. You're still young. Just looking at you. You're you're 36 or 37, and it probably isn't as interesting as you claim. Forest and more forest. I think it's monotonous. Oh, no, it's extraordinarily interesting. But every year, Mikhail Lovovich plants new forests, and he's already received a bronze medal and a diploma. He advocates the preservation of the old ones. If you only heard him speak, you'd agree with him entirely. He says that trees adorn the earth and that they teach people to understand beauty and instill a sense of pride in them. Forests help temper harsh climates. In countries where climate is milder, people struggle with nature less. And that's why man is milder and gentler there. There the people are beautiful, adaptable, passionate. Their speech is elegant and their gestures are graceful. The arts and sciences flourish there. Their philosophy isn't dark and women are treated there with elegant dignity. Bravo! Bravo. All that's very nice, but unconvincing. And so allow me, my friend, to continue to use firewood in the stove and build sheds out of wood. You can burn peat in the stoves and build your sheds out of stone. Well, I accept cutting down trees out of necessity, but why decimate them? For Russia's forests are shattering under the axe. Billions of trees die. Bird and other animal habitats dot lie barren. Rivers are becoming a shallow and drying up. 
Beautiful landscapes vanish irretrievably, and all this because a lazy person doesn't have enough sense to bend down and pick up fuel from the ground. Wouldn't you agree, madam? You have to be a blind barbarian to burn in the stove all that beauty to destroy what we cannot create. Man has given reason and creative power to increase manifold what's been handed down to him, but to this day he is not created but only destroyed. There are fewer and fewer forests, rivers are running dry, wildlife has disappeared. The climate is ruined and each day the earth is becoming poorer and more hideous still. Here you're giving me this ironic look, and you're not taking seriously any of what I'm saying, and maybe it really is odd, but when I walk by the peasant forest that I've saved from the axe, or when I hear the rustling of my young forest, planted with my own hands, I realize that I have a little power over the climate too. And if a thousand years from now people are happy, then it's partially my doing too. When I plant a small birch tree and, and then watch it turn green and sway in the wind, my heart fills with pride and I... However, it's time to go, but all this must just be too old, odd after, day, after all. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Well, will you then come see us? I don't know. Again in a month? Ivan Petrovich, you behaved absolutely impossibly again today. Why did you have to upset your mother and talk about perpetuum mobile? And today at breakfast you argued with Alexander again. This is all so petty. But what if I hate him? You have no reason to hate Alexander. He's just like everyone else. No worse than you. If you could only see your face, your movements, you're too lazy to live. Oh, this laziness. Ah, I'm lazy and bored too. Everybody criticizes my husband and looks at me with pity. Poor thing, her husband is old. This concern for me, oh, I understand it too well. It's what Astrov just said. You all are blindly destroying the forest, and soon there will be nothing left on earth. The same way you are blindly destroying people. And soon, thanks to you, there will be no loyalty, no purity, no capacity for self-sacrifice. Why can't you look with equanimity at a woman who is not yours? Because, and the doctor's right there, the demon of destruction is inside all of you. You have no pity, no pity for forests or birds or women or one another. I don't like this philosophy. This doctor has a weary and anxious face, an interesting face, Sonia must like him. She's in love with him. And I understand her. He's been her here three times already since I arrived, but I'm a little shy and I haven't yet a proper conversation with him. Haven't not have not been nice to him. He must think I'm that I'm mean. Most likely, Ivan Petrovich, the reason you and I are such good friends is that we're both tedious and boring people. Tedious. Don't look at me like that. I I, I don't like it. How can I look at you any other way if I love you? You're my happiness, my life, my, and, my, and my youth. I know my chances for reciprocity are measly, you're zero to one, equal to zero, but I don't need anything. Just let me look at you, hear your voice. Shh, they might overhear you. Just let me speak of my love for you. Don't shoo me away, and this alone will be the greatest happiness for me. This is unbearable. 